First off, I would like to say that this may not seem like the most spiritual of messages, at least on the surface. Yet this subject is something that is of great importance to the current church and applies to the theological concept of the body of Christ, or unity in diversity, to put it more literally. The idea that it takes many different kinds of personalities and skill sets to build a well-balanced church. Hopefully, by highlighting this particular diversity in God's kingdom, you will have a better understanding of your fellow church members and a better idea of how the theological concept of the body of Christ works in a more practical sense. As it so happens, the introvert-extrovert spectrum is a subject that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. If we are unaware or simply don't respect the differences associated with this spectrum, we are inevitably going to be in constant conflict with each other because of it. You probably already are in conflict with somebody because of this. You just may not realize the source. Like the old saying goes, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb trees, it will always feel as if it's stupid. Same thing with this spectrum. If you judge an introvert by the extrovert standard, they will always be made to feel inadequate by your unrealistic expectations, and vice versa. Which actually happens quite often. I say this because historically, America has tended to be a very extrovert skewed society, especially over the last century. However, social media may be changing that. This extrovert centric tendency has even infiltrated the church and it started to happen far sooner than you may realize. The question is, should it have? Or are those who are already turning their back on contemporary worship on to something? But before we get into that, I think it's best that we understand what distinguishes an introvert from an extrovert. So bear with me a moment as we go through all the technical details before we prove the science of it with scripture. An introvert is a listener, where an extrovert is more of a talker. Introverts tend to be quiet, where extroverts tend to be more gregarious. An introvert is a thinker, where an extrovert is a doer. Introverts are reflective, where extroverts tend to seek experiences. Introverts are strategists, where extroverts are more spontaneous. Keep in mind that this spectrum is but one aspect of the human psyche. So regardless of all the tendencies associated with this particular spectrum, none are absolute. Many other factors can skew some of the tendencies associated with this spectrum that I will be discussing today. Keep also in mind that nobody is a pure introvert or extrovert, and there are many degrees of introversion or extroversion. When you get down to it, the side of the spectrum you prefer is like being left or right-handed. Most of us have two hands and can use both of them, yet the most complex tasks require both working together. But we are ultimately more comfortable and productive if we stay true to our natural tendency by favoring our dominant side. However, the most defining characteristic of this spectrum is how we process social energy. An extrovert feels mentally charged by social interaction and depleted by solitude. It doesn't matter how valuable the time spent in isolation turns out, it will always drain an extrovert. Where an introvert is just the opposite, they feel drained by social interaction and charged by solitude. Again, it does not matter how rewarding and fun a given social exchange is to an introvert. Emotionally and mentally speaking, they feel depleted by the experiences. Think of it like standard gasoline versus diesel fuel. While they perform the same function, they are not interchangeable. In fact, there is an actual name for these fuels when we are talking about people, which would be dopamine and acetylcholine. 
In case you don't know, these are brain chemicals. And an introvert brain processes them very differently from the extroverted mind. First off, the extrovert runs on dopamine and social interaction gives it to them. It makes them feel good and without it they just don't feel normal. This gives them the ability to process and choose quickly. You have probably heard of people being referred to as quick-witted or good with comebacks. They are probably an extrovert. The ability to choose quickly is also a trait of dominance, which is why dominance is often associated with extroversion. From a sociological standpoint, people often perceive extroverts as being more intelligent because they are so quick with their tongue, which is not necessarily the case. It's just that in America, we tend to perceive more talkative people as smarter. It's the perception that's faulty, not the people that are judged by it. It also makes extroverts what we call low reactive. In layman's terms, it means they can shake things off easily, which makes them more prone to try new things and take risks, as well as not as responsive to discipline. For these reasons, they often become the leaders of this world, as well as explain why our leaders frequently get themselves into trouble. As you can see, there are good and bad aspects to being an extrovert, regardless what society tries to tell you. The introvert, on the other hand, responds quite differently to dopamine. It makes them feel overwhelmed, like a jittery, too much coffee reaction, which makes them high reactive and much more cautious and disciplined than the extrovert as a result. The introverted mind prefers acetylcholine, this brain chemical gives them a sense of calm and peace when isolated, which is the state of mind that they seek. While they process more slowly because of this difference, the trade-off is that they have the ability to process more deeply and thoroughly. While they may seem inactive, lazy, or even stupid to the extrovert because they want to stop and analyze everything before acting, in reality they're Quiet exterior masks a mind that is always bubbling with activity. Introverts have the tendency to be more creative, sensitive, and loyal because of this crucial difference. So they often become the scientists, philosophers, writers, artists, and inventors of this world. Again, there are both advantages and disadvantages to being an introvert. The extrovert brain responds quite differently to acetylcholine, though. It gives them a cabin fever-like feeling, like not enough is going on, so they are easily prone to boredom and loneliness when isolated. One thing we need to take from all this is that, apart from an act of God, there really is no changing this about people. Personal preferences and social stigma aside, once the many factors that shape who we are become set, what energizes and depletes us will remain the same no matter how much we pressure ourselves or others. Such pressures do happen. I have observed them and experienced them for myself, even in the church, hence the conflicts I spoke of. With all that being said, there is a prime example of this spectrum in the Bible, and it can be found in Genesis 25 with the story of the twin brothers Jacob and Esau. Verse 27 says, The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Such a simple verse you may have read over a hundred times and never gave it a second thought. Yet there is a valuable insight about God's creation here, that way back in the days of Genesis, this spectrum existed, Jacob being the homebody introvert and Esau being the active extrovert. The famous story where the younger twin steals the birthright of the elder brother actually reinforces the concept further, but it might not be readily obvious why. Starting with verse 29, Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom, 
which means red. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. What we see here is Jacob being a strategic introvert, specifically by using Esau's extrovert tendencies against him. Like I said before, extroverts tend to be spontaneous. At least that's what we call it when it turns out well. When it doesn't, we call it impetuous, which is what Esau was here. There have been studies done on this tendency. What they reveal can be summed up by this example, which is an actual social experiment utilized by psychologists. If you offer people $10 now versus $20 in two weeks, the introverts will tend to be patient enough to wait for the higher reward, where the extroverts will more likely go for the more immediate payout. So Jacob, in a devious move, waits till Esau is in need and baits him with just what he required right then and there. So Esau, being the extrovert that he is, thinks only of immediate gratification and gives no thought to what the long-term harm he was doing himself. Strategy superseded spontaneity in this case. As you probably know, Jacob the introvert ends up inheriting the promise of Abraham and the blessing that went with it. So we can't hardly say that God favors extroverts as America and some churches do. But let's not assume that introverts rule in the Bible either because of this one example. Take King David, for example. He was called a man after God's own heart, and he was a man of action, a doer, a mighty warrior who wrote many highly emotive psalms that paint a picture of extrovert-style expressive worship, and actually worshiped that way himself when he danced before the Ark of the Covenant. He was clearly more of an extrovert himself. Yet David's son Solomon, who was called the wisest man ever, was a deep thinker who spent much time pondering, studying, and acquiring knowledge, and he wrote much of what's called the wisdom literature in the Bible, a rather cut-and-dry example of an introvert. So one should not say there is a bias in the Old Testament for both sides. We're called to contribute to it. But what about the New Testament? Well, John the Baptist was described as a bold and outspoken man, clearly the trait of an extrovert and he was used to play a vital role in the unfolding of prophecy concerning the Messiah. Where Paul is described this way in Scripture, 2 Corinthians 10.1 says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. Then again in verse 10 it says, For some say, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. A common introvert trait is to prefer and seem more impressive in writing than face to face. For writing allows the introvert to think through and choose their words carefully at their analytical pace. So what about Jesus himself, you may ask? Well, he certainly taught very socially and interactively. He wasn't afraid to confront people who were in the wrong, as you might expect an extrovert. However, he also valued his quiet time. He frequently sought solitude to pray and meditate all alone, as an introvert is more likely to do, which would seem to indicate that Jesus himself was an ambivert, a true equal balance on the spectrum, a unique and rare trait indeed. So one can only draw the conclusion there is no reason to endorse any bias in the church at all. This tells us that God, in fact, recognizes that both sides have a unique skill set to apply to the body of Christ, rather than a one-size-fits-all approach to church. As it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 
22 through 25. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Yes, there is room for diversity in the church. In fact, it's demanded. And we should respect and honor that diversity, rather than defy it by expecting everyone to feel, act, interact, worship, and learn in the exact same way by recognizing that we all have unique needs and weaknesses, as well as talents, to offer. That is what the body of Christ is about, bringing the many different strengths together. For when we do that, our collective strength is magnified and our weaknesses are minimized. We can't be truly Christ-like as a church without it. For no one person can be all that Jesus was in his divinity. But as a collective, we can be and should be. And unity and diversity is how we do that. As far as application goes, it takes an introvert to come up with the next great idea, but it takes an extrovert to put that idea into action. For all the ideas in the world are no good if they never see the light of day. Just like all the initiative in the world can be a dangerous thing without a good idea that maintains Christian integrity to apply it to. If you take anything from this message, it's that. And I'll say it again. It takes an introvert to come up with the next great idea, but it takes an extrovert to make that idea happen. But in the end, God needs to get the glory. We ensure that by following his model for church, not our own comfort, convenience, and preferences, let alone if we get the most credit or not. As you may have noticed, I've repeatedly mentioned this cultural bias within America and the church that has seen the most change in the last century. So let's take a brief look at that so we can see how it really has played a role in our church lives and hopefully give us insight on how to create a more balanced body of Christ as Jesus always intended. The very first denomination is what's known as the Roman Catholic Church. Their worship centered around what is called liturgy. In short, it was a very quiet, reflective style of worship that contained a lot of consistent ritual. In other words, a very meditative environment that gave introverts the calm and peace they find desirable. Over the centuries, there has been a shift away from that, some of it simply because the extroverts were bored to death and felt unwelcome and left out. So naturally, they started to recreate things to their liking when they could. One of those big shifts came with the Protestant Reformation. Not that it happened for that reason, but it did open up a door that eventually allowed Orthodox liturgy to get phased out and make way for a more extrovert friendly environment. Much later came the evangelical movement. With this movement came a greater value being placed on feelings over knowledge, which allowed worship to become more spontaneous and less ritualized. So I'm sure it was here that the church began to attract more extroverts than it had before. It's certainly a good thing to finally reach a group that was unattainable before which certainly encouraged the church to continue with this trend that they started. The father of Methodism, John Wesley, believed in something he called social holiness. He believed righteousness was a team effort, not one of solitude, which is but one example of humanity's tendency to go to extremes rather than a good balance. In the end, we will always need both. This idea of emphasizing feelings and experiences was taken to even greater extremes with the charismatic movement. So if you felt it, it was expected that you express it externally so everyone can see it and feel energized by it themselves. 
While that tactic does work for extroverts, it can make the introvert very uncomfortable. Then in the early 20th century, there was a broader cultural shift that came at the hands of secular teachers like Dale Carnegie and Warren Sussman, who moved it from a culture of character to a culture of personality. According to them, it was no longer a matter of how good a person you were, but how personable and sociable you were. In more recent years, there have been the megachurch and emergent church movements. Such churches are more about providing experiences or provoking a feel-good response, giving the extroverts the ideal church environment that gives them the external stimulus they desire, but can be overwhelming for introverts. Perhaps that is why there has been a revival of liturgy these days. Introverts are pushing back at what they see as a shallowing of the church. Again, this is a very brief and simplified history to summarize centuries in but a few sentences. But when you get down to it, traditional churches tend to be introvert-skewed and contemporary being extrovert-skewed. That is the mark that this extremism has left on the church that has left it polarized rather than unified. Because in the end, we have either clung hard to the past or have gone to the opposite extreme, rather than recognize that both sides have something valuable to offer to the body of Christ and need to be represented. As it says in Ecclesiastes 3.3, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. That's true with every aspect of life not just church life. But what we typically see instead is a long-time traditional church getting shaken up by someone who wants to change it to contemporary. While that person may mean well, what they fail to recognize is that a long-established traditional church will likely have a high amount of introverts in it, and they are never going to be the ideal crowd to sell expressive contemporary worship to because it will never resonate with them the same way it does the extrovert that instigates such change. It can go the other way too. For example, a long-established contemporary church will naturally have a large number of extroverts in it. Then a leader comes along and says we need to be more seeker-sensitive in order to reach out to the lost and unchurched. So they eliminate a lot of the worship elements that could scare off new people but fires up the extroverted regulars' emotions. Again, not an ideal audience to sell such an idea to. Either way, many will fight such actions, thinking only of their comfort. And if both sides of the conflict are insistent on winning rather than resolving through balance, it cannot turn out well. Because if one side wins, the other side loses, and the losers will naturally feel rejected and alienated. Is that what we really want to do? Reject half the church for our own sake? That is not how the body of Christ works. But if we are a truly unified and balanced body of Christ, things like this should not happen. Extroverts should be allowed to worship out loud and be their expressive and dynamic selves without the accusation of being a crazy weirdo. Just as introverts should be allowed to be their quiet, reflective selves without the accusation of being dispassionate sticks in the mud. Most importantly, we should all be happy for one another when someone else's spiritual needs are being met and be willing to be a part of worship practices that do little for you for someone else's sake on occasion. The body of Christ is about us, not me, and there is way too much me, me, me in the church as it is, which is what has really polarized the church. Like I said before, we have two hands, or two sides to our personality, and so does the body of Christ. The church, just like individuals, are most efficient when they use both hands together, not just one, even if it is the dominant one. 
So it can be good to stretch our horizons beyond our comfort zone and utilize both our hands on a given task or worship practices. Keeping in mind, as rewarding as switch hitting may be, there is still that price to pay that we can't maintain living outside our side of the spectrum all the time. We need to allow ourselves time to recharge after a depleting task. Personality is like a rubber band. It can stretch, but only so far and for so long. Push it too much and it will snap. Let's go back to the biblical story of Jacob the introvert to see how his horizons were stretched. Specifically the time when he must reunite with his brother Esau. In this story, Jacob is obviously scared that Esau will want to get revenge for the theft of his birthright. So Jacob utilizes introvert strategy just in case Esau does attack by breaking up his people into two camps so at least half can escape if the worst happens. He also sends ahead a gift of livestock to appease his brother. But despite that, Jacob drags his feet in a vain attempt to avoid this potential confrontation. For introverts tend to be non-confrontational and avoidance oriented that way. That is where we end up here with this perplexing story in Genesis 32, starting with verse 24. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, which means face of God, saying it is because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. So what do we see here? Jacob was resisting using his extrovert side by not facing a potential conflict in a forthcoming manner. So a man later identified as God brings a conflict to Jacob. And God does not face him on a safe mental introvert level either, but in a very physical extrovert way. In essence, telling him it's time to face up to this problem that you created, and it's going to take your more aggressive extrovert side to do that. Once God proves to Jacob that he is capable of embracing this side of himself, what does God do? As the passage itself says, When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Now think about that. While we see God pushing Jacob beyond his safe zone, would crippling his hip make him more of an extroverted man of action like his brother Esau? Hardly. If anything, just the opposite. So obviously God was not trying to change Jacob into a full-time extrovert. Just build up his spirit so that he could act like one when needed. Perhaps in a way God is saying, I accept you as the introvert you are, but still. I need you to know there is more to you than you think there is. Because Jacob just might have changed his mind and never returned home if God hadn't done what he did. The very next verse reveals this. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, which implies a passage of time. So Jacob didn't exactly run out and face his fears with a take charge attitude right after this event. Of course, that would have been difficult with his newly acquired limp, which afforded him the chance to mentally recharge after this aggressive experience with God, so he would be able to do what he had in a fresh state, as an introvert requires, and he did. So be true to yourself. 
but don't be afraid to step outside your self-imposed boundaries either. There can be rich rewards to submitting to God when He pushes us. Not so much when the world does it, which they will, so be aware of that distinction. Like Jacob, there's often so much more to ourselves as individuals than we realize. So there is even more to us as a church than we realize too. But we won't know where we fit into it if we are a stranger to ourselves, or just following other people's paths to conform for the sake of human acceptance. So we must be conscious of who we are following and why, whether it's comfort, convenience, approval, validation, or God's will. And casual Christians won't be able to discern that very easily. But that is another message for another day. So what does this all mean in practical terms? If you are an introvert, you may be coming up short in the fellowship area of church. One thing you must understand about introverts in fellowship is that they can enjoy it if it revolves around meaningful and relevant subject matter. However, they often have a very low tolerance for idle and superficial chit-chat, meaning it may take longer to build a good enough relationship with them to get them to that fellowship stage. However, keep in mind that there are more ways of participating in fellowship than just shooting the breeze. It's about giving of yourself, and there are lots of ways to do that. For me, it often involves art and teaching. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I do do. I utilize my strength as much as I can and stretch myself where needed as well. For example, public speaking. It's not something we normally associate with introverts, but when we do, we compensate by being well prepared and speaking on things we are truly passionate and knowledgeable about. But I assure you, our social energy will be spent for the day when we do, but well worth it. While I might not be all that expressive in everyday situations, but I can be on paper and canvas. Praising God does not have to be limited to shouting and raising of hands. Extroverts may look only to obvious external expressions, but God can see our hearts. I certainly don't limit myself to what John Q. Extrovert can easily see. Neither should you. Introverts often lack in the area of outreach as well. Some would even argue that the words introvert and outreach are incompatible and use the idea of evangelism as an excuse to dismiss and criticize introverts in the church, as if that is the only thing the church does. Well, extroverts can be good at getting people in the door and making people feel welcome once they are in the building, extroverts often lack the depth or delicacy to answer the hard questions a newly church person inevitably has in a non-confrontational way. For many extroverts see it as their duty to challenge and disprove conflicting viewpoints as a way of demonstrating a superior worldview, which can come off as too aggressive, arrogant, and unloving, which drives people away. Jesus was not one to use the aggressive power of the extrovert with the lost, just the prideful religious people. We should do no different. Many an outreach effort has fallen flat due to being unable to get people to stick. This is where the introverts can and should step in to offer their quiet brand of power, to win people over with sensitivity and understanding, even as hard as it may be for them to try. Let me put it this way. It takes an extrovert to get them in the door, but it takes an introvert to nurture their wounds once they are there. Everyone has room to grow, and introverts often need the help and guidance of extroverts to do so. Not your criticism, not your judgment, not your pressure, but your help. And that help needs to be offered with the understanding that such things don't come as easily for the introvert as it does the extrovert. We need help to not be afraid of the noise of expressive praise, to not be afraid to stand up for the great ideas we come up with, to not be afraid to share our spiritual aha moments that we had in solitude, 
to not be afraid to do and experience things in a real world way, not just an internal one. But don't think the extroverts are getting off that easy. One of the places they need to challenge themselves has to do with learning. The apostles' teaching is one of those things believers should be dedicated to. Yet extroverts may have a distinct disadvantage in that area, for the simple fact that they tend to have short attention spans. I plan on doing a whole message on how we learn next time. In fact, I've already written it, so I won't get too wrapped up in that now. It's important enough and big enough a subject that I just can't sum it up in a single sentence. But again, I repeat, the help introverts offer the extrovert in the area of study needs to be offered with the understanding that such things don't come as naturally to the extrovert as it does the introvert. But there is one other area that extroverts need to address that I will say something about today. That is purpose. To explain what I mean, let me quote Susan Cain, an expert on the introvert-extrovert spectrum. Teens who are too gregarious to spend time alone often fail to cultivate their talents because it requires a solitude they dread. While she specifically addresses teens, this issue often lingers into adulthood. For example, I once joined a church just as it began the 40 Days of Purpose. The pastor expected people to just jump up and live out their purpose, simply because he gave the right reasons why. But it didn't happen that way. I tried to explain to him that many didn't have a clue as to what their purpose was. His answer to that was, they should. A typical dominant extrovert response if I ever heard one. And believe me, that is exactly what he was. My response to this was to lead a group study on identifying your purpose. It quickly became apparent why people didn't know what their purpose was. They simply had no sense of self or who they were in Christ, just as Susan Cain's quote indicates. As an introvert who knew nothing of the spectrum at the time, this sort of blew my mind. How can someone ever not know themselves? Wherever you go, there you are, after all. But in retrospect, I can clearly see all these people were mostly extroverts who really were not in relationship with themselves, or spent much time in meditative prayer. By definition, extroverts tend to look to external things like approval, acceptance, and validation for fulfillment, not through self-reflection and prayer, as an introvert naturally does. So if you are an extrovert lacking a purpose to direct all your passion at, then you are definitely going to have to stretch yourself to engage in some time in private prayer and meditation, where you listen as well as speak. For nobody but God himself can give you that answer or send you in the right direction to find that answer. However, it may take an introvert to teach you to not be afraid of the quiet it takes to hear God's whispers. It will take an introvert to teach you the subtleties of Christian doctrine and theology it takes to require the spiritual maturity to live out said purpose. I hope you get what I have been driving at here, that those in the body of Christ need to meet in the middle and help one another for God's sake, not change others into a version of yourself for the sake of your own comfort and convenience. We need to rejoice in our differences, not eliminate them. It's a simple and common human failing of church leaders to try and recreate a church in their own image and temperament, to project their own spiritual experiences onto everyone as if they are universal. They always use the same argument when people resist too. If you were faithful, you would follow my lead. Never recognizing it takes little faith to just be true to your own temperament, as they are. The inherent diversity in mankind can be the biggest strength we have if we embrace and honor it as instructed in scripture. However, it can be our greatest liability if we try to defy and fight against it, which our sinful nature will lead us to do. Speaking as an introvert myself, the understanding I have found within my research has really granted me a lot of peace that I was lacking. 
It's helped me to understand myself as well as others who think and feel and act differently than myself, specifically why they react to me the way they do. It's really freed me from a lot of false guilt heaped on me by extroverts and allowed me to accept myself as God truly made me and not as the world would recreate me in its so-called ideal extroverted image. No matter what side of the spectrum you're on, you are probably in relationship with someone on the opposite side. Perhaps they are even part of your church family. They may even drive you insane on how they approach life. The concept of unity and diversity and how the introvert-extrovert spectrum fits into it will certainly help you to understand them much better. So embrace spiritual diversity because you value God's words about his creation and you care about others as God intends, not just yourself. When you get down to it, we fail to live out the body of Christ's model when we are exalting self above others, as well as God's will. I urge you to consider the ramifications of such arrogance very, very carefully. <laughs>